Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as everyone funnels in, I will introduce myself a little bit as it starts raining. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Danny Cerezo. I'm the events coordinator here at One Day Sooner. Super excited to welcome you to our event on the upper limit of risk uh, in clinical trials specifically. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from our fantastic panelists and to get the chance to ask some questions at the second half of the event because we'll be breaking out into breakout sessions, which is always fun. Uh, before we begin, let me just let this one person in. Uh, before we begin, I just want to do a quick overview about how breakout sessions works. I know we've all been on it for, for work and for school and for all of this stuff, but always helps to go over it one more time, uh, especially when there's an update. So Zoom has recently released a feature called self-select, which means that you can um, choose your own rooms. And if you have the latest updates, you'll be able to, when I release breakout rooms and open them up, you'll be able to decide which one you'd like to go into. And you'll do that simply by going to the bottom of your screen where it says breakout rooms and clicking join next to the room that you'd like to join. Uh, if you don't see this feature, do not worry. I'm happy to do that for you. Just if you don't see it, just uh, type in the chat box which one you'd like to go into and I'll just move you in there. And that's no problem at all. Uh, so with that being said, and as the rain comes down even harder by where I am, I will turn it over to Mabel, who will be opening the event with the topic and introducing our panelists. Thanks. All right. Welcome, everyone. And thanks so much for joining us. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting topic, really interesting evening, interesting panelists, and interesting discussion, I'm sure. Um, so just to, you know, really quickly introduction, um, you know, when we're talking about medical research, um, there's almost always some risk involved, some kinds of research more than others. Um, whether we're testing, experimenting, studying, there are variable outcomes, there's things we can't predict. And sometimes that's why we're doing the research, of course. Um, sometimes it's something we account for, you know, we think there's an acceptable risk for the potential benefit. But the question this panel is asking, of course, is how much risk is acceptable or tolerable or justifiable? I think there's a lot of different language that we can use that evokes this question in somewhat different ways. Um, and I think we can also think about the flip side of this, which I think is actually what a lot of the, a lot of the panelists are talking about in their research, which is not what risk is acceptable, but what benefit is great enough to make a risk acceptable. Um, so I think both sides of those things will be will be relevant and, and uh, we'll want to keep thinking about, about how those two things interact with one another um, and, and again what everybody's talking about and who gets to decide what the question is and what the answer is. So of course this is a key question for human challenge studies because they can certainly be risk, riskier than, than other kinds of medical research, but this, these questions are certainly not limited to challenge studies, much less to challenge studies for COVID-19. So we have a great set of panelists here to discuss. I'll do really quick introductions of them, then each of them will talk for a couple minutes and then um, we'll do some more Q&A. Um, Erin Paquette is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University, where she also has an appointment in the School of Law. Richard Chappell is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Miami. Lena Jeweler is a research assistant in social and behavioral sciences at Johns Hopkins University. And she's also a potential challenge trial volunteer. And David Resnick is a bioethicist at the National Institute of Environmental Health Science at the National Institutes of Health. Um, so you'll be hearing from all of them uh, in that order. Um, and so we'll start with Aaron. Aaron, you're muted. Okay, sorry, I was trying to click on unmute, but it wasn't working. I was just saying thank you for that lovely in introduction and the opportunity to, to have this discussion with everyone on the panel. Um, <clears throat> I have just a few slides. I'm going to try to keep remarks brief. Um, since I was going first, I am uh, going to try to frame a, a couple of the issues that uh, Mabel outlined in thinking about um, upper limit of risk in research. And um, in particular, what I'm hoping to talk about a little bit in the breakout room is um, ethical considerations to justify when participation in research is appropriate, when an upper limit of risk can't be adequately defined. Um, I don't have any disclosures to report. Um, and I'm going to outline two assumptions for um, the comments that I'll make. One uh, um, that, are, that are commonly um, uh, sort of stated in, in uh, literature describing um, risk in research. 
Um, the first is that risks assumed by research participants should be reasonable, balanced, and minimized in relationship to the benefit for an individual. And secondly, that vulnerable groups and those don't, who don't have the capacity to provide voluntary consent um, shouldn't be exposed to more than low risks. And what low risks means is a, an entirely different question that we're not addressing today, but those are um, kind of underlying assumptions. Um, Unfortunately, that you know, this would be an easier question to answer if uh, um, it were outlined in the, in the multiple guidelines that we have um, uh, concerning um, uh, uh, ethical uh, underpinnings for uh, research. But in the several um, really canonical guidelines, we don't have a clear statement about what upper limit of risk would entail. The Nuremberg Code, for example, outlines that you shouldn't perform any experiments where there is concern for um, death or disabling injury, um, but qualifies this that the human importance of the problem can um, alter that, you know, that calculus. Um, the Declaration of Helsinki indicates that the importance of the objective um, can outweigh, um, if it can outweigh the risks and burdens to subjects, and that might be justifiable. Um, the Belmont Report indicates that interests other than those directly related to the subject could be relevant to justify risks associated with research as long as the subject's rights themselves have been respected. Um, the CIOMS guidelines indicate that the research risks have to be appropriate in relation to social and scientific value of the research, and the common rule here in the U.S. requires risks are reasonable in relationship to anticipated benefits. So there's a lot of balancing language um, in many of these guidelines, but no clear delineation of what an upper limit might look like. Um, and there are several arguments that, you know, go against setting um, an upper limit of risk. Um, and I've outlined a couple here uh, that are that are well um, stated in the literature. Uh, one is that um, putting an upper limit of risk would be an unjustifiable constraint on individual autonomy, that, in, that people ought to be able to weigh risks and benefits for themselves and make decisions about whether they participate. The second is that, that um, we permit voluntary assumption of risk in other settings. And so why should we not permit that in research if we allow people to take on um, risks like skydiving, zip, you know, been reading about all these zip lining tours coming up on the summer. Uh, but if we allow these, um, uh, these decisions to be made in other settings, why should it not apply in research? Um, and, and that ultimately we should allow um, really an unlimited upper limit of risk with um, robust informed consent. Um, and then there are arguments on the other side, um, uh, the, the two largest that I've, I've noted here. One is that um, some paternalism is acceptable um, when you're thinking about how individuals consider risk in research. And, uh, and paternalism basically uh, you know, means that we might limit things above what people would choose to do uh, because we think we know better in some way. And this idea of soft paternalism is that some risks or some studies may be so complicated that an individual really can't adequately assess the risk benefit ratio for themselves. And if they could, they would make a different decision so that it's appropriate to say at some level, we're just not going to allow you to participate in research that that, that that's risk, that is that risky. And then, and then secondly, that um, we ought to have an upper limit to protect confidence or public trust in research, that if we um, allow um, research with unfettered risks to move forward, and then there are, you know, we've heard of, of, of research um, scandals or of, of um, deaths or, or disabilities um, occurring in research, that it would undermine um, ultimate paternalism. Um, uh, I'm sorry, ultimate um, confidence in research. And so we should, we should try to avoid that by not allowing um, very risky research to move forward. There have been several proposals for setting an upper limit of risk, including placing objective um, limits on risk, um, uh, using procedural approaches to compare research risks to other acceptable risks, um, and then finally to compare research risks to other socially acceptable activities. Um, but, uh, and these, these last two are really what are called comparator approaches. Um, and, and basically what we're trying to do there is say, well, is the risk in research similar enough to other kinds of risks that it's acceptable? Um, but there are problems with this approach. The first is that it's easier to know likely risks of benefits of a known activity than it is for research, right? If you have a gen genuine research question, you, you don't know that calculus in advance in the same way you would know for a comparator. Second is that um, those involved in comparator activities, some often the, the, um, uh, the soldier is invoked in this um, example, they're often given higher social status than research participants. And so there's a benefit attributable to that that is not felt in research. Um, but ultimately that unless the activities completely align, it's hard to know that the comparator justifies the research risk. 
So um, to how do we move forward from here? And um, the discussion that I'd like to have is um, what um, I proposed with a colleague, which is that two ways we can justify um, research as the level of risk increases without necessarily setting an upper limit is to raise the social esteem of the research participant such that there is more um, status or benefit attributable to that, to that research participant status. And the second is to improve prediction about the social value of research itself. We saw in the number of guidelines that, that the benefit to others or the benefit to society was a relevant consideration, but we don't have good ways to measure this. And so I think those are important, um, two important potential pathways forward. Um, and with that, um, I will uh, I'll, uh, take any questions um, as we, uh, after we move through the rest of the panel um, and wanted to say thank you again. Great, thank you so much. So Richard, you are up next. Great, thanks very much. Um, so my basic view is that there's no absolute upper limit. Um, given informed consent, at least, um, the risk just needs to be proportionate, that is outweighed by the expected social value of the information to be gained from the research. Though as we've just seen, there's often uh, difficulties knowing exactly how to assess that. But as a matter of principle, I think that's how it should be determined. Um, and as far as the core values go, I think that sort of strikes me as reasonably straightforward that there's a strong case for this, because there are really two key values that I think public policy should be guided by. The first is beneficence, promoting the overall good, and the second is autonomy, respecting individuals' choices about their own lives. Now, conflicts between these two values can be morally really tricky, but if both of these values point in the same direction, um, as they do in the case of valuable, socially valuable research involving willing volunteers. Um, in those situations, then I think it really should be a no-brainer. There's just no good reason to engage in what we might call anti-beneficent paternalism, intervening, preventing people from doing something that's actually for the overall good, um, not, just, uh, not just a matter of like their own interests. So going back to John Stuart Mill, he famously argued that we should interfere with people only for, to prevent harm to others and not in order to paternalistically impose our own view of what they should be doing with their own lives. Now, people have pushed back against that to some extent, but I think it's especially perverse to interfere with someone in order to prevent them from altruistically benefiting others. It's like the very opposite of what Mill would be all about. He'd be sort of turning in his grave um, with those sorts of, those sorts of interventions. Um, so I think it just seems like a big moral mistake. Akin to, for example, banning kidney donations or forbidding heroic rescues by volunteer firefighters. It's just a very strange sort of thing to do to intervene, to prevent people from voluntarily doing things, which would have made things better, uh, better for others. Um, so that's really the heart of my case against imposing risk limits upon willing volunteers. In my paper with Peter Singer, we additionally proposed a principle of risk parity, according to which, quote, if it's permissible to expose some members of society, for example, health workers or the economically vulnerable, to a certain level of ex ante risk in order to minimize overall harm from the pandemic virus, then it's permissible to expose fully informed volunteers to a comparable level of risk in the context of promising research into the virus. Now, again, I think it just makes no sense to block, prevent willing volunteers from taking on some level of risk if such obstruction has the effect of effectively condemning a far greater number of often unwilling people to even greater harms from the effects of an out of control pandemic lasting for longer than it needed to. So I think there's a real question here of what alternative sort of principled value could outweigh the combined force of autonomy and beneficence when they point in the same direction. In particular, I think we surely don't want to say that the risks resulting from actions, however consensual, automatically trump comparable or even greater harms that would result from inaction. But that seems to be the kind of thing that one would be committed to in, in order to um, engage in this kind of anti-beneficent paternalism. I think that such considerations about action versus inaction might influence our gut reactions or our moral intuitions, but they just don't seem very principled. Um, so I, at any rate, uh, look forward to hearing more about what my fellow panelists have to say. Thank you so much. Lena, you are next. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because my dog has chosen this exact moment to um, have, have, have a moment. I no. Um, hopefully that does the trick. Uh, <laughs> it appears not. Um, so basically, uh, can, you, can you hear me okay or is this too much of a commotion? Great. Okay. So I'm, I'm coming at this from, from a volunteer's perspective. And when I was first asked to participate, 
um, you know, I was trying to think like, okay, what is the upper limit of risk that I would be willing to accept here? You know, what seems like a reasonable bar? And what I kept going back to was like, well, it depends on what the research is like, you know, um, and, and thinking about other activities, like if you put a button in front of me, it told me, you push this button 50 50 you just like perish off the face of this earth but also 50 50 like climate change is averted or you know whatever some incredible social good um that seems like a no-brainer right like you push this button there's a hundred percent chance that you die but you avert climate change maybe like i don't know it, it gets really hard to weigh these risks and benefits but but it doesn't seem like there's a great way to mathematically balance out like okay, we're doing this much good for this part of society. And so here's the risk of death and here's the risk of long-term outcomes. And, and it's a lot of math. And I know we've got really great um, modelers out there and bioethicists out there who could figure out how to kind of balance all these things. But at the end of the day, it seems like having an institution like the IRB or the WHO kind of regulate that balancing um, poses a lot of concerns in terms of like putting those bounds on individual decision-making. So I think rather than kind of trying to wade through that risky net of what the balance should look like and who gets to decide, what's important is protecting the research participants who choose to take on risk, right? So rather than thinking like, what's the upper level of risk that we should allow, we should say, like, okay, great, we're glad that you want to participate in this research that's gonna maybe have some social good, maybe not, hard to say, research is risky, but if these bad things happen to you, like here are the ways we're gonna protect you. So like with COVID, we could say, um, listen, we think your risk of death is really low, but we've seen these kind of concerning reports that there may be some long-term heart and lung issues. If that's the case and you suffer these issues as a result of your participation, like here are the medical insurance benefits that you're covered under. Um, that sort of thing is, is what I'd like to discuss in my breakout room, how to um, protect research participants undertaking risky research given that they should be allowed to accept um, whatever risk they choose for social good. All right, thank you. And David, you're last. Thank you. So um, a lot of what I was already gonna say has been said, so I will go through my thing really quickly. Um, we've already talked about autonomy. Um, is very important, there's no risk limits, but we do uh, limit autonomy uh, for certain things. We're worried about certain values being eroded or threatened like respect for human life, uh, health and dignity. So there are laws we have that prohibit people from taking certain risks. Dueling is no longer legal, <laughs> which it used to be in the old days. And there's other things you can see on, here on this list where for various social reasons, we say you cannot take this risk. Um, now, as far as risk to limits, uh, lim placing limits on risk to healthy volunteers, I would say is three reasons to avoid unjustified harm to healthy volunteers, to avoid exploitation of healthy volunteers for money, um, and to avoid harming the research enterprise because of damage to the public trust that can happen with if healthy volunteers die or are significantly harmed in research. Um, and, and I would like to just stay here that what I'm talking about is not COVID-19 uh, challenge studies, but the ordinary case where you have clinical trials done by uh, contract research organizations and uh, people are volunteering for these clinical trials to make money basically, not for altruistic reasons. And they also, the benefits are questionable. We're testing a new drug that may or may not ever get approved. And even if it does, it may be a copycat drug. So in the ordinary case, I think, because often informed consent is not perfect, there's the element of exploitation, uh, and the social benefits are often questionable in certain uh, kinds of healthy volunteer studies. Um, the limits are justified in the ordinary case. So what I would say is how do we establish these limits? And I am from the camp that says these should be socially acceptable um, limits. So we're worried about basically what will people think if something bad happens? Um, and so you're looking at social acceptability and the comparator would be, I would think we could look at occupational risks 
So if we think of human research participation as like a kind of paid labor, um, here's, you, here you can see on the screen a bunch of different occupational risks, deaths for 100,000 people per full-time equivalent, highest for fishing and hunting workers, lowest, well, actually the lowest there is not even on the list, it'd be like office workers and things like that, and all workers is 3.5 per 100,000. So if you place the risk limit is somewhere arbitrarily, this is an arbitrary placement, somewhere on this chart between 45, 145 and zero deaths per 100,000, um, and say we consider this to be a fairly socially valuable activity, so we'll go to the higher end of the list, say 100 deaths per 100,000, um, and you also assume that there's 20 adverse, serious adverse events per death, which is about the rate in clinical trials. You get a number, uh, something like this, you get 25, a uh, risk limit of 25 deaths per 100,000 people and uh, 500 serious adverse events for 100,000 people. And there's the probability of death you should expect is 0.0025 and the probability of an SAE is 0.05. So these are rough guidelines. Um, and I recognize that COVID-19 is an extreme. So these are guidelines, not absolute limits. And COVID-19 is an extreme case where we might be justified in breaking the limits we impose in the ordinary situation because we have an extraordinarily uh, extraordinary thing with high social benefit. But even then, I, I would wonder whether um, we would feel comfortable. I don't know if I would, uh, as an IRB chair and an IRB member, of approving a study where the risk of death was greater than one percent, and you know, and you're not going to um, benefit. Now, obviously, in cancer clinical trials and things like that, where there's a benefit to you, we would justify extremely high risk, but the benefit to you is offset by that. So, I also look forward to the discussion, and um, thanks for having me. All right, so I'll just throw a few questions. Um, I think a lot of what I'm gonna ask is addressing one person's concerns to another person. So I'm gonna start with Richard and ask how your model or your way of thinking addresses public trust. Um, so if something harms, only do, doesn't do harm to others personally, it might do harm sort of more broadly in terms of those, that public trust in science. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that is a really difficult thing to take into account partly because it's just so difficult to estimate in advance um, what kinds of um, effects as we're going to be willing to accept and understand that, you know, these were, you know, in a, in a COVID challenge trial, for example, these were kind of extreme circumstances. And so um, the kinds of risks that we should be willing to take in this case um, won't necessarily carry over to research. And so there'd be grounds for thinking that we the public wouldn't necessarily be um, like put off of future research because of risks, greater risks that we're willing to take in a pandemic. But that's all speculation. I don't really know how to assess that. Um, I guess what I'd really want to do is to hear from more empirical experts, you know, sociologists and psychologists and so forth to help give some input into evaluating um, the social value of the research relative to the social risk of the research for the research process and public trust going forwards. My, my default sort of, um, assumption is to is to think that we should sort of um, um, by default be on the, the side of kind of allowing valuable research to happen when we don't really have a strong basis for expecting terrible public backlash. Um, but I'm certainly open in principle to, to thinking, well, maybe those, these indirect effects could be significantly bad that it would outweigh the benefits. I just need to kind of hear the, hear the argument. Anybody else want to respond to that? I'd like to respond. I think, you know, obviously this is an empirical question, but there are some factors we know from history that are relevant to public reaction to research. One of them is when you have a vulnerable or exploited population. Uh, look at the Tuskegee study and look at research on prisoners and things like that. And, and that is always a concern you cannot ignore is that you may this may be something that comes up. You may find that you know, a high proportion of socioeconomically disadvantaged people are participating in these challenge trials and something goes wrong. And then all of a sudden there's the specter, it's not only the risk specter, but it's a specter of you know, vulnerable or disadvantaged populations or whatever. And that's gonna lead to 
all, you know, a whole kind, another kind of dynamic in terms of the public's outrage. Um, so I think it's very, very important to be thinking about the population of volunteers or participants that are in the study in terms of how you expect the public to react. Can I follow up just very quickly? So I do think one thing that's maybe really important to stress here is that, I mean, the past scandals involved violations of informed consent, right? They're the things that are really terrible. And I think every ethicist would agree that they're terrible. Whereas what we're imagining here is cases of the public just reacting badly to bad things happening, even though all of the people involved did you know, consent to it and they weren't deliberately deceived or anything like that. So in a way, I would kind of hope that ethicists would be able to push back against any like confused backlash by highlighting the really important moral differences between past genuine scandals involving failures of informed consent and um, just merely unfortunate results um, that, that might happen. It does seem like there's a pretty strong difference there that I, I would hope that we would be able to maintain a real distinction. I'll just respond. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, well, I, well, in principle, I agree with you that um, historical violations of informed consent or guidelines for research are responsible for a lot of the scandals and, um, and the public uh, response to those. However, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't necessarily think that people will see a distinction when there, are, there could be associations between um, vulnerable groups as Professor Resnick um, outlined and, um, and bad outcomes. You know, I think you, you, you might, in principle, be able to rationally have a conversation with someone that the people that on, went into this study undertook that risk. But I, I don't think that's going to eliminate questions about systematic um, potential targeting or exploitation of a group, even if you have individual consent, uh, valid, what people would argue is valid individual consent from members of that group. So I, I, I think there is a broader question. Um, and I, I think we have to, we have to see sort of, um, the fact that um, for the broader public, um, the nuances of getting informed consent from an individual versus the, the perceived risk of, or, of exploitation of groups in general, um, I think those could easily be conflated and, um, and lead to undermining future trust in, in research, particularly by underrepresented groups whose trust in research you really wanna bolster given the history um, that we've had, you know, within specific groups. Let me just add one more thing quickly in that a lot of the scandals that have occurred since the adoption of the federal regulations in, in the, you know, 1981 have involved uh, consent that was regular in compliance with regulations, but was still defective and also involved um, uh, conflicts of interest, um, other factors which um, led to public outrage of various kinds. And, and that's another thing to think about is, you know, not only who the participants are, but who are the sponsors, right? And who stands to make money on these clinical trials? Because if something bad happens, people are gonna follow the money and whether it's right or wrong, they're gonna point fingers that way. Well, speaking of money, um, this is a question for actually both Aaron and I think David will both be able to speak to this effectively is uh, what's the role of compensation? And so I'm thinking particularly of uh, Aaron, so you're talking about, you know, promoting higher social status among, um, you know, among research participants as one way to address, uh, address some of these issues. Um, or, you know, is there a role for just simply more financial compensation to promote that status in some way? Um, this is a tricky question, and I have different, um, slightly different perspectives on this issue, depending on what the conversation about compensation is about. So in general, um, I think that people ought to be compensated fairly, um, for, and, um, and I should say that I also think there's distinctions between incentives to participate in research, reimbursement for costs that are encountered, and compensation for time and, and other efforts, and those are different uh, there could be different justifications for setting those at different levels. Um, I, I think that when we're talking about risk, raising compensation as a mechanism to justify risk, um, I think um, at, at some level you're going to hit a, a boundary where it becomes 
um, unduly influencing on a decision. And so I, I think that that is not the, um, that shouldn't be the primary role by which an, indiv uh, an individual participant's status as a research participant is, um, is recognized. I think um, there are, you know, similar to the way that, you know, people are, um, may receive like um, reciprocity for participation in a trial that ultimately, you know, led to development of a, a new drug or, a, you know, an important um, new intervention can be one way. Um, but I also think that um, just, um, I, I don't know how to put a word on this, but elevating someone's just social, like, um, social status or recognition or respect for the fact that people um, did place themselves in a, in a situation of risk for research um, is another way to kind of meet that um, meet that target without necessarily financially uh, becoming um, you know overly burdensome. Um, that being said, and we can maybe get into this later, I do think there are certain um, equity considerations where lack of adequate compensation becomes a barrier for those that want to participate in research, um, and and I think for justice consideration separate from risk, um, it may be necessary to elevate compensation in those settings, uh, but that strays a bit from the primary question. So I'll leave that as an aside. Yeah, and David, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, I think she said what I would have said. I think there, there's a balance between paying people too much and paying people too little. You pay people too much, you're worried about undue influence over their thinking and judgment. You pay them too little, you're worried that you're, uh, they're, you're exploiting them. They're not getting a fair share of, of the research. Um, I do think we need to be careful to distinguish between the ordinary situation um, where we're talking, where, you know, versus COVID-19, which may be extraordinary. It may be that it's so extraordinary that, you know, just participating in the trial might be uh, an incredible benefit for those that, that want to participate. Um, you know, historically, they can say to their grandchildren, whatever, you know, I participated in this trial that helped, you know, end the pandemic. Um, that's a big deal, you know, and, and, but that's a very different situation from, you know, the ordinary research participation where money is pretty important to these people. Can I add to that? Um, I just kind of want to push back a little bit on the the distinction, the the such such a rigorous distinction between COVID and and you know traditional medical research because I think you know even small scale research that happens every day can have profound effects on people's lives, right? Like we're not talking about like COVID versus like hair loss medication. Like there's a lot of things that happen um, in, in the middle of that. And I think to say, you know, like I took on some small amount of risk to like help develop an imaging agent that makes it easier for kids to have brain. Like there's like a lot of, of gray area in there. Um, and, and, and then I think the other part that like makes this um, divide or, or balancing act um, especially tricky is that, um, you know, we're talking about socioeconomically disadvantaged people who feel that research participation is the easiest primary only way to make a significant amount of money and we're worried that that constitutes undue coercement et cetera et cetera um so i think a lot of this is actually upstream of of um challenge trial or like clinical research compensation like um it, you know the efforts there should 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 be pushed outwards on looking at fair compensation for other types of work, right? Like, and, and other social safety nets. Like, I think putting this solely on the backs of, you know, IRB or medical science is, is asking a bit too much given the, the circumstances that we see elsewhere with, with people struggling to, to make that choice. So those are, those are the two pieces I wanted to add there. Yeah, the thing that I was thinking about was, you know, we, while well, we sometimes pay more for riskier, Employment labor and sometimes pay less. So you know. So where does that fit into uh, to that those modes of compensation? Um, where do those fit into medical research? All right. I'll ask one last question and then we'll head out into breakout rooms and everybody can ask sort of individual questions to the different panelists. And that question is: um, This was starting out as a question for Lena. 
is what are the risks of um, hindering or fostering risky research? You know, if we ask if we ask uh, you know the sponsors to do a lot of work towards towards you know post trial care and that kind of stuff, in the end, are we ultimately going to hinder innovative research or risky research? Um, and is that uh, what is the balancing act there? Yeah, so I definitely see the concern, right? Like if you're the sponsoring agent and you know that there's a chance that you're going to have to shell out all this money because your child participants are going to develop all of these like complex health issues, like that is in some ways the mechanism working. Um, like if it's so risky that it would be difficult for the sponsoring like agency to say, um, this is worth it. Like the NIH should be funding socially important research, et cetera, et cetera. So like that's kind of how I anticipate that working is kind of like a, a level in the other way. Um, uh, you know, it's difficult because there are, um, you know, these big corporate players who have more than enough money to support that, right? Like if we're talking about like a Pfizer or, you know, like running out CROs to like fund research that's gonna make them tons and tons of money, it doesn't seem to me that they would be willing to pursue research that is gonna be so financially devastating to them that they wouldn't like be able to fund it, if that makes sense. Like that aspect seems less like it would limit those corporations than actually the, the social piece that we were talking about earlier and the possibility of social backlash. Anybody else wanna to respond to the question of how we foster or hinder uh, innovative research through uh, risk limits? I, I don't, my, I guess one thing I might say is sometimes you can actually encourage research by letting people know what the limits are, right? Um, if, if they don't know in advance whether they'll get their study approved or not, then why submit it to the IRB? If, there, if the IRB already has some kind of policy or something that says, look, we, we accept these kinds of risk limits, then the sponsor can know in advance whether to submit the study. Um, and that, that can actually be helpful, I think, sometimes. All right, Dana, you want to set us up for breakout rooms? Missions first. So I think we we need multidisciplinary efforts that combine um, the, the scientists who are asking the research question about whatever trial intervention there is. But we need also epidemiologists that can track the pattern of the emerging um, disease um, impact this potentially disproportionate impact on different communities for whom um, that could impact either the way they weigh the risks and benefits of participation and or the value that the trial has to contribute. So I think we need epidemiologic tracking and a framework that allows us to do that. Um, the other thing I think we need to do is we need to pair with sociologists to get better ways of getting public input into what high social value means. Um, and I think that we, you know, we talk a lot about community engaged research, but oftentimes what that ends up being is an attempt to increase rates of participation in research by a certain community. And it's not really responsive to what that community itself might define as valuable or necessary. And so I think one way to not only measure, but potentially increase social value in research is to really get engaged in communities um, have participants, have um, uh, study team members that are parts of communities that are helping to define the research questions that are being asked, assess whether the studies are appropriately addressing those questions, and modify um, you know, either what they're asking or you know, what, um, what uh, might need to happen in a given community to increase the value of the results of the research, right? So, you know, maybe um, if you're uh, talking about a vaccine trial, it's, um, it's being very um, um, transparent and clear about post-trial access to that vaccine once the trial is completed and how that might be um, proportionately distributed based on burden of disease or some other marker that is responsive to what 
a community might find as important as an outcome of a trial. So I, I don't know if that directly answers your question, but there's some of, the, you know, I, I don't think I'm qualified to do the work, but that's the work that I think needs to be done to try to um, help with assessment of social value. I think Zachariah has a question. People can feel free to just jump right in. It's a just a conversational environment. Yeah, uh, thanks, um, Erin, and uh, thanks, Lena. Thanks, Mabel, for uh, for the for the cue. So my my question is in two parts. The the first one leads off with a thought that I think from many conversations and many experts, it's it's understood that risk is a personal matter, so to speak. Uh, every individual has their only acceptable levels of risk that they are willing to take. And as far as that goes, I don't know what institution uh, qualifies perfectly to take the decision as how far someone's individual risk can be or should be, uh, given that it's a personal matter uh, to decide how far one should take uh, that risk. Then this leads, of course, to the next part of the of the question now that if risk is a personal matter, then the economic dy dynamics come into play again. When you talk about people volunteering for trials who are from, let's say, low income backgrounds, does the risk in their case uh, become higher or lower, you know, coupled with the concept of their agency? Because these, these are all factors that must come and at play that while we're respecting individual agency to make their own decision as far as how much risk they're willing to take, at some point the institution come at play, you know, to try and decide who is at a higher risk based on whatever factors now. I'm just drawing in the, the idea of, you know, the economic uh, status or, uh, you know, income. Anyone can take this one. Um, I think in many ways, I agree that assumption of risk is a personal, um, is a personal calculus that one has to do and um, that it, I think I would, I would start to push on it at the point where assumption of personal risk led to um, potential um, harm to others um, and that that might be the point at which somebody assuming risk on themselves uh, e e for what for financial benefit or, or otherwise um, might no longer be appropriate and um, uh, forgive me because I'm working this example as I speak rather than having it well thought about in advance but I'm thinking about uh, you know a single parent who has you know four children um, who are young and require uh, supervision, attention, care, decision making, you know, I think that one might question whether that individual, um, whether it'd be appropriate for them to assume um, a, a participation in a very high risk clinical trial that may leave for children without a parent. Um, and in a worse state that they might be than with a parent. Uh, it's, and I, I, as I said, that it's not a fully fleshed out example, but I think that you know, when someone's risk assessment starts to have uh, potential negative consequences for others, I think it, it's appropriate to, to think about limiting that decision. Yeah, um, just just to, to follow up, since this is a conversation as yeah. <laughs> as it has been mentioned. So I, I like the point that you, you've raised that when individual risk kind of uh, begins to affect others, uh, I guess it poses a threat to others. Now, in the, in the event of, let's say, someone volunteering for a COVID challenge study, I think it's it's safe and reasonable to say that that risk is somewhat very, very, you know, individual centered and the person is going to be in a quarantine facility and technically speaking, they're not really going to be exposing other people to, to threats. If anything, that risk is very limited to that individual and 
if we were to expand that notion, would be saying that the benefit is actually what is being given out to to the society rather than uh, a threat, right? And I, I do strongly think that in that scenario, it is important to respect the agency of the willing participant who is informed. And, and that's why it, it's always a debate really. The whole, at least to me, I think the whole idea of um, levels of risk, uh, of risk rather, are very arbitrary. They are, for the lack of a better term, really institutionally imagined perceptions of what would be acceptable to individuals running those institutions rather than a formulated you know, calculation of what is realistically risky. I think institutions being what they are, are manned by individuals like yourself, like myself, and individuals tend to be in a way inclined to be either very conservative or you know, liberal. And I think those personalities come into play in the institutional structures when it comes to analyzing these risks or the levels of risk that are acceptable. That's why I think if we try to marry agency and free will, and even if we go to the extent of human rights, when an individual decides to say, okay, this is what I want to do for myself or to my body for the benefit of others, then the whole question of risk becomes very, you know, tricky. And on the point that you haven't touched very uh, strongly on, uh, for people who are coming from poor backgrounds like, like myself, I could easily be excluded from a trial because apparently my decision is somewhat affected by my economic status because it's assumed that a person who's in Britain participating in the trial gets, let's say, 5,000 pounds for the trial. That money is maybe about a month's wage. The person in Britain living in London, for me, who's in Africa, 5,000 pounds in a month, that's like 10 months of rent or 10 months of, of pay. So it, it takes away that, it takes away my rights because I'm poor. It takes away my right to make my own assessment of what risk should be. That's why it's always debatable why the, the actual standard of risk should be. I'll put it there. I was thinking um, as during that discussion about that, um, that, uh, example that you posed, Aaron, of the of the harms that could come to somebody else by participating in research. So, as as a single parent, if you have children that you're young children, you're responsible for, you know, potentially that could be somewhere that we would want to to pose an upper limit. Um, and I was trying to think through, you know, what scenarios that person would be willing to participate in high risk research. Um, knowing that there is a risk that she would or she or he would no longer be able to, to, to care for their children or you know whatever um that circumstances and you know i think when we're talking about research participation you know by default we're talking about people who can consent to research people who are you know of stable mind it's, you know that that whole paradigm um and so at that point it's just really hard for me to picture a scenario where this person would be fully informed able to consent and consent to high risk research given their like responsibilities for other people absent you know this is literally the only option they have for financial compensation and then like i think that brings us back to the point where like it's not really a medical ethics issue anymore it's more of a societal ethics issue where we're putting people in this position where you know participating in risky medical research is the only way to like provide for their family. Um. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I guess what I was trying to say is that I think that the same way in which one might consider benefit to society in their assessment of whether they would want to assume high risk research, the risk to others, I think potentially also 
and and maybe not risk that is like a like a result of being infected in a challenge trial, but risk as in the un, the potential consequences to others if something were to happen to that individual in a trial. Like I think that's uh, I, I think that's a consideration that ought to come into play. And I completely agree with you that if the situation arise, you know, it's hard to imagine that situation coming into play for something particularly risky where they would want to participate unless either one, um, we have um, over assumed the ability to get adequate consent um, and the person is really not adequately informed about what the risks they're undertaking, which I think we have to consider as a serious potential problem because we know that there are, there are we are, we are not as good at informed consent as we, we could be. Um, so I think that's one possibility. And then the second possibility is that the issue that you raised that even if they are adequately informed, if they would choose to assume that risk, knowing that it put their children that they were responsible for at risk of losing parental uh, you know, a, a supervision, um, then, then that's, a, that's a larger you know, societal issue to address and, and you know, need putting um, enough uh, resources in play that that is not the driving force behind the decision I think would be important um, in that circumstance. But I, but I actually think the problem of, of thinking that we've gotten good consent when we actually haven't is the bigger um, probability in a situation like this. Biased or distorted responses on the part of uh, sort of IRBs and so forth, especially when faced with you know novel circumstances like the pandemic. I wonder to what extent is, if insofar as boards have this habit of responding in ways that you know not taking any risks that might end up making them look bad for having approved something risky. But of course, no one blames you when you just you know do nothing and society ends up suffering as a result of not having the needed research. Um, there's a worry here that this could end, end up leading to, as we saw in this pandemic, you know, bad stuff happening when we could have done something to prevent it. I worry about the kind of the systemic kind of incentives for, um, for having sort of boards making decisions in a way that doesn't actually track the things we want them to be tracking. I wonder just to what extent you think that's a, a serious concern. I think that's always a concern. Um, I mean, I think IRBs are very risk averse when it comes to legal risks and other risks. They, they really are. And, and I don't know any other way to put a stop to that. I mean, because we're a litigious society, there's always a specter of a lawsuit. There's always a specter of the audit by the FDA or OHRP or, you know, other organizations, um, you know, looking over your back. Um, so, you know, it's a real, it's a very real thing. People don't want to have to be, um, you know, be guilty of something later, right? And, and do you think that this would give them like legal cover? That, that's an interesting point. Yes, I do. I mean, that's, that's always a, that's a, a really interesting point. If you're in the law, right? You know, because there's a standard of care and you can say, you know, we sued for negligence or whatever. You can say, well, we were within the standard of care. We were, you know, blah, blah, blah. We were doing what other IRBs do. And this is the accepted limit for risk. And we, you know, and so we're fine. You know, um, of course, that wouldn't affect the public. We're just talking about the lawsuits that would follow. Um, and we actually, we haven't talked about that, but we must really realize that the prospect of a lawsuit in research is a very real thing, uh, you know, that worries people too. So just to follow up on it a little bit, do um, you think that if there had been a credible commitment by the administration and by, say, like senior FDA officials that um, any IRB that allowed human challenge trials to proceed, you know, would be exempted from you know, an audit or there, you know, there was some credible commitment on that, on that end. Do you think there would have been an IRB that proceeded with that? Or do you think that the risk aversion of like of the PR backlash would still be too great? I, I, I don't know. I think it'd have to be a very brave IRB. <laughs> um, Could I, I, don't think it would, I don't think it would be an NIH IRB. I'll tell you that. Isn't the IRB, isn't the whole idea of an IRB is that it's an independent 
body that doesn't suffer like it doesn't have like conflicts of interest so it doesn't suffer like consequences you know that is, it's not supposed to be it's supposed to be like independent so it seems a little weird like an IRB would be would be would be concerned about lawsuits well the independence is supposed to be there to prevent the institution from pressuring you into approving a study. That, that's what the, the laws say they can't do. They can't approve a study that the IRB is not approved. But I mean, the lawsuit, the legal, the legal ramifications are not easily ignored. Um, we're also, we're not just talking about the IRB, we're talking about the investigators getting sued too. Right, the investigators and the institution and the IRB. If a lawsuit goes down, everybody gets named that the lawyers can possibly name, and it's a real pain in the butt for everybody involved, even if if, if it just gets settled. Right, um, so I, I don't think any any institution is immune from that in the United States. I mean, government institutions have government immunity. Like I feel less worried about lawsuits working for the NIH because of government immunity, but that's still not, you know, 100%. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you look at any, any informed consent form, look at all the legalese that's in it, the discussion of compensation for injury and the discussion of, of confidentiality and privacy and a whole bunch of stuff. Is, is basically put in there in a sort of a legalistic manner to protect the institution and the investigators from lawsuits. Uh, could, I, could I make a question? Uh, here I live in Brazil and so I know that in, in country we are going to have the, the, of the law to allow us to to take the vaccines to be a tester of the vaccines so I don't know how many time how much time will take to so that I can be a person that is going to take the vaccine it looks like to me that will be taking a long time until I take that vaccine. Uh, so I I want to be that person to be testing the vaccines, but uh, I believe that will take a long time, but I hope that will, that my chance will take soon uh, because I want to help. Uh, and I believe that everybody here wants to help and I want to help, but if I could go to long to, to be testing the vaccine, I, I would like to go, but the, I believe that's not possible. But I'm here just waiting my chance. That, that's all. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, there's been, I, I was also trying to get into a, a vaccine trial and it, back in November and it was waiting, 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 waiting. <laughs> and, um, we've had a lot of people wanting to do challenge trials. And I think that the fact that they were not able, that the government did not put their full force behind challenge trials for COVID-19 is one of the great ethical failings of the pandemic uh, because the, the bottleneck was not manufacturing. The bottleneck was the FDA and getting the EUA. And we know that because, um, when Pfizer finally got their EUA, they had millions of vaccines ready to go. Um, we had 30, we had, uh, we have 30 million, we had 30 million or 20 to 30 million AstraZeneca vaccines in early January ready to go. Um, they still haven't gotten EUA. Um, so even um, just 1 million vaccines, which is a relatively small amount, several months earlier, if you had given those vaccines to the elderly, or very at risk people, uh, it's easy to do a back of the envelope calculation show that tens of thousands of lives would have been saved. Um, so I, I totally sympathize with uh, Diego's um, frustration 
And, you know, my question for uh, David and Richard is, um, do you think people should be held accountable for this failure in decision making? And how can we prevent this from happening during the next pandemic or uh, say a biological weapons attack where we need to quickly, quickly develop and validate vaccines? Well, can I just go quickly? Uh-oh, all right. I, I think the way forward is to develop policy and actually part of that policy should be vaccine challenge trials uh, as part of the normal vaccine testing process. We, we're not, we haven't really done that yet. This is the first time that we've considered that, but I think sort of normalization of this, making it part of the effort is that there would be challenge trials under certain conditions as part of the whole vaccine testing. I think it would be a good move. Yeah, I mean, I can I'm really happy that to hear a huge that. moral failure yeah. and yeah, it's definitely important to, to help normalize the idea and get people on board, the general public and especially policymakers on board with the idea that this is an ethical and indeed ethically mandatory uh, in some circumstances way to proceed.